меня зовут Мариана. Well, hi everyone. I'm Mariana and I'm a marketologist. Our club of um, anonymous marketologists anonymous has not grown that big, but today I would like to talk to the few of you that are here on uh, working with social networks, social media. My presentation is entitled Hidden Powers of Social Network, but these powers are not, in fact, hidden. These powers are on the very surface of things. And as people who work with, in marketing, we have just find ways of using it for our benefit. First of all, uh, let me once again introduce myself. I am Mariana, and I'm a marketologist. I've been working in game development for seven years. Our company is based in Tallinn, Estonia, and we develop mobile games. But I'm sure our products are well known to you, as they are well known worldwide. And we now have uh, reached about 350 downloads. And when I just joined them, Facebook for Business just didn't exist. And there were no business pages on Facebook or product pages on Facebook. And for me, my, my personal, it was just my personal interest to see uh, how I can promote on Facebook as soon as, as I, we had Facebook, basically. And I started to explore it and use as, as many resources that we had to grow our reach via Facebook. The platforms grow themselves, and now we have more and more tools that are more and more convenient for us to work with. But at the same time, we also have limitations that the platforms entail. But first, we have to start with the question, what do you need the fans for? Why do you have presence in social media? Why do you invest time and money to attract audience that you supposedly should follow you and is expected to interact with you? So this is what your typical Facebook page of a game looks like. And here what we see is what about 3.5 million likes, right? Okay, so what kind of value do we have behind it? What kind of value do we have in it as developers? Why are we so focused on these uh, numbers? Do they bring any value directly? Everyone who's worked with uh, social media knows that your outreach of a post on your page is limited to about two to three percent of your existing audience. And why is this the case? Well, Facebook algorithms filter the content that the users see at several points. And let's imagine that this Average Facebook user with about 100 or 200 friends and uh, who's following about the same number of pages. And the number of information that he or she is going to see in their Facebook feed, uh, if you put it all together, will add up to two to three thousand. This is something no one, no one can digest. And in order to improve usability, Facebook sets limitations. And therefore, the feed is not chronological. There's the relevance score that determines when you see this or that posting post on, on Facebook. And uh, this relevance score is calculated on a lot of assumptions about how interested the user will be in your content. This is what we have to deal with. Um, this is the platform's algorithm. This is what Facebook determines, uh, and you cannot really change it. But you can, you can find ways to improve your outreach and engagement uh, per post. 
And you can do that by optimizing the com very content that, that uh, you put on your Facebook page. And I think the main rule behind it, and the only rule behind it, is that you should have relevant content. Content relevant to people. You should post what people want to read and not what you want to sell. One of my favorite Facebook channels, one of my Facebook favorite Facebook pages, is National Geographic there. It has about 40 million followers. How do they do that? They, they post exciting and interesting stories. And we try to do the same uh, with our game pages on Facebook. We are not selling the, the race, no, the racing game. We just share uh, their followers' love of cars and interest in racing. These are two things that are very different from one another, right? And if you don't directly reference the game, but rather talk about the car industry in general, say uh, recently the Mustang of Ford's um, fame has, has been celebrating its 10th anniversary. This uh, generates much more attention from our followers than if, it, if you post something directly connected with the game. So what I'm getting at is that there is an opportunity to balance between the information you want to get across as a business and the information that the users want to see and that will keep them engaged with your pa with your page keep engaged but also keep following if it's just pure marketing on your page then you're really abusing those likes you're not uh, leveraging them in any way But I was one. I've. I think uh, what I mostly wanted to talk about is how to get the most out of the existing audience. Say you've balanced out uh, the. You found your recipe for finding relevant posts uh, for your page. You have an audience of 1.5 million, say, and then what do you do with it? How do you leverage it? Well, this, there are. Of course, the foundations, the A to Z of the Facebook marketing, that you can do that. That's one thing. But what I've been very excited about recently is to learn about your audience. Unfortunately, now we cannot collect a lot of stats about the audience that has been following your page. Facebook tools are fairly limited and only give information about the demographics and perhaps we could see what other pages they have liked you know in, in that are similar to ours so shall we meet the couple of users this is this is Liam who's 32 and he lives in San Diego California there's a number of interests, as you could see. He's, he's, he follows football, that is, American football. He's into cars, documentaries. That could be Discovery Channel. He likes rock music, and he plays a neat Nitro Nation. Meet also Emma. Emma, who's a South African, and who's uh, into cooking. She's also a romantic novel reader. She has pets and uh, she plays zoo craft. So what do you think is in common between these two people or characters? Sorry, we, we couldn't hear that. Um, these people have one thing in common and that is that they don't exist because these, this is these people are stats generated people this is these are not real people these are an archetypal fans of uh, Nitro Nation and Zucrept uh, 
respectively. Your Facebook page, of course, can tell a market researcher almost everything about you, but you have to do it manually. You have to really scroll through, you have to look through a lot of profiles. If we have people who, who like us or send us a comment uh, or write to us, then, then we, I, I did go through uh, their, their Facebook pages. And after that, we do a profile based on open access data that, that Facebook has. And we did this profiling. I know it sounds creepy, right, doesn't it? But And now I can actually show how, how this works. So this is your typical Facebook uh, page. This is, I think, me, my, my page, and I think it, it's a good material uh, for a psychological uh, snapshot of, of who I am. I, I watch this and that TV series. I read, as you can see, fantasy or sci-fi. Some people tag what, what sports they follow, and it's available. this data is available there. For sports, I, I, I think it's, it's very important. This, these are the two posts that we designed for Nitro Nation, and these two were had the biggest audience reach uh, throughout the history of, of our Facebook page. What we found out was that the majority of our U.S. audience was about to watch uh, the Super Bowl, which is of course a big thing and you can we couldn't afford you know a two million s advertising slot at the Super Bowl so um, we had to go around it a little bit and we designed the, this this post on, on on the day of, of the Super Bowl and uh, we ran a Facebook campaign around that same time because what people do during during the uh, uh, the, the, the break time. They, will leave, they would pick up their smartphone and uh, they will look up what's on what's on Facebook, right? You know that, like if you follow soccer, I, I bet uh, the, a bottle of whiskey that, that you do you do the same. After 45 minutes is over, you take your smartphone and uh, you check what's on Facebook. This was a one of the most successful ad campaigns that we had uh, on Facebook because uh, recently we they had the, the so-called uh, uh, game of, of the century when Conor McGregor uh, had to face uh, Gregor, Ma Gregor Massway. This event is not as big as uh, football, of course, but we f could find out that most of people who play Nitro Nation, they also follow boxing. So that's what we did. Now to music. Facebook sometimes tags your music interests and sometimes we tag them ourselves. So on one hand, this is information about uh, that you can use to do a campaign that would follow similar imagery that the band you like uh, does. But we took another route. We found out that over 70% of Nitro Nation players actually all listen to heavy metal. So now for some videos. So this is uh, the video that we designed originally. No, 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 sorry, mixing up, mi mixing up. So this was the video that we designed originally for the company campaign and uh, this is was one of, of, of the game trailers actually. Can can we have the volume a little bit up? Yeah, there you go.
cool music as well, isn't it? Nice tune. You just just makes you want to dance, doesn't it? And after the the last study, we changed to, to this one. We had a Tallinn-based um, heavy metal band, Free Casual, do the soundtrack for, for this video. I think they did great. And what we finally have is the joy of changing some important stats. Look at that. These are the three videos in comparison. First was rock music. Second, there was Super Bowl video that ran uh, halftime, and the uh, first video that that I showed. So our CTR has gone up 0.3 uh, percent and bring down the cost per installation by about 50 percent. Do you still believe that audio audience profiling is useless? Well, look here. I think that so you, you saw it yourself that such a small tweak as, as changing the music for your video promo is, has allowed you to change things so profoundly. And there's much more information on uh, our Facebook profiles, and this is something we can and should use. It's uh, it's a matter of thinking it through and finding ways of using it. So take some si take some time to profile your users to understand what they're like. It takes your time, yes. Consume resources, yes. But I think it gives you information that can be very effectively put to use. So thank you so much for following. And I, and I, and I do hope that you have some questions because, because we have a ton of time. Thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. Um, do you use Instagram in any way? I think, I think that's even, even trickier there. So, how do you target your followers on Instagram? We do, we do work with Instagram, and I think hashtag is uh, the key to Instagram. This uh, the only way you can communicate with it. Instagram is a channel where the best way to promote is to have a lot of hashtags that can be relevant, that will allow people to find you, to find uh, your photo or video. And I e this also stats about the most popular hashtag on the Instagram. So this is something that is available to you that you could follow. And I think the best strategy for Instagram is uh, the follow back like I follow you and you follow me that's uh, so far the best thing you could do on Instagram because there's little data that you could uh, use about about the users there but I think the actual anal analysis of, of the photographs people post is uh, also productive Instantly, we were doing uh, the study for Zoocraft, and it turned out that 70% of our subscribers have a pet because they post uh, pet photos, uh, photos with pets. We now know this. We haven't yet come up with a solution of how to use it, but I think it's very useful, isn't it?
Good afternoon, Stanislava Seneshkina from Wimpelcom. CPI, your CPI cost, did it include the video production costs? That is, you spent money to, to make one video, then another video, then you hired a band to make to, to record the music. Did you include these costs into the OCPI calculations? Well, this is, these are production costs, so you didn't take them into account, did you? Well, the, if you're talking about this data, these are Facebook screenshots. So this is not what I designed, this is what I see as an administrator. But if you break it down per install, did it make sense? Of course it did, because uh, if, if we have half the cost of uh, installation now, and if we spend, I don't know, 500, 1000 euros to uh, make the video, then it still makes sense, given the amount of traffic that we that we have uh, to procure. Well, of course, if, if your video cost only that much, well, the first video cost about, I think, 150,000 euro. That was the most expensive um, marketing material I've ever, I ever worked with. And this, we, this one we used for many years, and we did the recut for, for several times and we recombine it uh, to make uh, to make other videos over a long period of time actually I also have a question if I may well you said that you look through the pages of your followers and you do that manually what kind of tools do you use other than what Facebook gives you? How many people do you, do you have do this, this Facebook profiling for you? Unfortunately, we don't have the tools uh, so far that, that could help us automate this. Now, now Facebook itself is, is uh, I think, designing a solution that will be avail available to businesses and will collect statistics in more detail. Uh, but now I have to do that manually and to look through about 500 profiles. I sp it, it takes about, about a week, I think. You can look through, I think, about 100 profiles in a day if you're a human being. And normally we have one to two people do that. We spent one five day week normally and then we collect the data about the likes their movies uh, TV series and shows and the books they read we collect it in in Excel and then we use we use some maths to to understand what is the average quote unquote user looks like Good afternoon, thank you so much for your presentation. You said that you so far have not been using any tools to automate this work, but perhaps you could create a task for a designer uh, who would eventually come up with a, with a solution to this problem. Well, it's a wonderful question. I think I, think I, will, be, I will be able to do that. When we do this by hand now, I'm thinking that, that if there was a script what you could integrate with Facebook that would collect this data for you, that you don't have to take the data from, from the screen and put it into the table and so on. So it's about having a script that would at least be able to collect the movie titles or the book titles 
add it to your database and then so that then we will see the most frequent ones that is uh, how many of our followers or players now watch Game of Thrones do you watch Game of Thrones everybody's watching Game of Thrones of course and it's interesting to ask a question how many players do we have who actually do watch Game of Thrones and I think we did miss the opportunity with, with a new season, but we had we've been tempted we've been tempted to uh, organize an event around the the premiere of the new season. Did 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 I did I have uh, a good answer for you? Yeah, yes, you did. I also have a question over here. It's interesting to know uh, how do you use the existing database for your new pro project. Say so you have this audience that follows Super Bowl and at uh, boxing. Do you have an understanding that they are more likely to spend in your game? Do you maybe now have a vision that you? can target this group of people with your next game? Well, unfortunately, it's hard to tell how much money this, these uh, guys spend in the game. We don't have any direct connection between their Facebook profile and the idea of the user who's being spending money in the game. And they can have different accounts, nicknames, and so on, which we frequently cannot really tie to the Facebook page. But so we kind of can look at it, but this statistics will be skewed because I think because people who are active on our Facebook page, they either players, they either they they kind of hardcore gamers. That's are really engaged with our game, they're really into that. And therefore, even if we make these connections, I'm not sure the st stats will be very useful to us. So you don't, th do, do you do Facebook logging? You know, some apps use, uh, allow their users to log in into the game via Facebook and that gives you direct access to the person's profile and so on. Well unfortunately here we face the European personal data protection regulations which this allows us uh, to store any personal information other than the Facebook token uh, which is actually encoded which we cannot if so they do when they do logging um, via Facebook, then we don't really understand what this person is. Can't, ha can't uh, store any other data than this. Another question, if I may, then. Uh, so you s you've demonstrated how your studies have uh, some sort of result, but is there a some reliability behind it because uh, it can be successful once and uh, unsuccessful the next time. Well, so far our success rate has been 90%, so it seems to uh, that, the, that it makes sense to invest into such manual analytics. And all the promotional materials that we designed based on these studies, they've performed very well. So they've performed better than, than the control group. And it's not only our Facebook posts, it's also at the, the Google Play, what we show on Google Play, when we change our logos, when we change the screenshots or game descriptions, uh, that is what person sees on the store, uh, we uh, have been tweaking that as well, and we experimented with that. I think I think that's it. 
let's uh, thank Mariano once again. Hi, we're at 4C with another one of our speakers. Hello, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Leszek Szczepański. I'm a senior gameplay programmer at Guerrilla Games in Amsterdam. Great, uh, so tell us, let's talk games. What's your favorite video game? Uh, Neverwinter Nights. That's an awesome choice. What's the very first game you've ever played? Uh, I don't remember. I mean, uh, I had an original Nintendo, so I played like Contra or Mario, but the first game I actually remember playing well was Doom. <laughs> I was way too young to play it. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's some time ago. Uh, how did you get into the industry? Uh, actually, I was a little bit lucky. Uh, I was studying at the time, and like in between u universities, so to speak. Uh, and my sister said, hey, there's this co company doing games. Would you be interested in applying? I applied, and I got a job in mobile industry. And for five years, I did mobile games until I figured I'm done and started doing console games. Not bad. But uh, if you had the chance to go back to the time and give yourself one advice, what would it be? Uh, don't worry about school, just make games. You hear that? That's what I'd want. So um, tell us, uh, what do you like and hate about the modern industry? Um, Okay, so my perspective might be a little bit weird because a lot of people complain about the crunch, working conditions, so on and so forth. I've been really lucky where I work right now because the working conditions are really, really good. Uh, the only thing I can complain about the AAA industry is that um, even being like a in a senior position, you don't have that much control over what you're building. And you have dreams, you have things you want to build, but you're still like part of, of the process. If you're like in a 200, 300 uh, person team, you would like to make a bigger impact. On the other hand, we are building amazing things. It's wonderful to work like five or seven years on a project. And after you know, seeing all these prototypes, bugs, failed builds, and so on and so forth, see the thing on YouTube or on the disc and actually playing out uh, more than you had imagined or, or, and much more than you could have built on your own. Well, speaking of building things on your own, imagine you had full creative financial uh, freedom uh, over your own project. What would it be then? Oh, I'm a horrible nerd. So I would just create like an isometric uh, role-playing game. So, so something like Fallout or Baldur's Gate. Uh, so something like that. I'm not sure about the setting, maybe something futuristic, but like a really hardcore isometric role-playing game. That would be something I would do on my own. 
Uh, speaking of futuristic, where do you see the industry going in the future, like in 10 years' time? Maybe some breakthrough technology? Oh, I, I'm not really sure. I mean, we've been talking about the end of PC gaming, end of console gaming for years now, and it didn't happen. So I think that there will be small revolutions coming on, like new technologies, new ideas, but we will be still sort of standing on the shoulder of giants. So PlayStation will be there, Xbox will be there, Nintendo will be there, and there will be a lot of stuff, and we will continue growing. Consoles will continue growing, PC will continue growing, mobile will continue growing, and new technologies like VR, AR, or God knows what else will also continue growing. That's, I think, that's what I think, I guess, at least. Is crossplay going to become a thing, you think? Sorry? Is uh, crossplay going to become a thing? Like between different consoles? Or? Yes. Uh, I think so. I mean, uh, there's only benefit to that, right? And it, it already happened before with different, uh, different games. So I think it will happen, but it's not to peop up to people like me to, to make it happen. Well, uh, speaking about tech, we have VR, AR, and lots of uh, amazing stuff. Do you think uh, these new input methods will eventually replace conventional controllers or not? Uh, I definitely don't think they will replace. I think they, um, they will be their own thing in, in their own right. So people were talking about mobile replacing uh, normal games, and that didn't happen. People were talking about mobile replacing even handhelds. And yes, the handheld market is so much smaller, but it's still there. I mean, how many people bought the Switch and walk around with a Switch, right? So I think VR and AR will be just another market. More people are coming into gaming and they want other ways to play. Yeah, definitely. We're trying to see into the future here uh, at 4C. And uh, what's your opinion on the conference so far? Uh, it's really nice. Uh, it's actually well organized. I'm, I'm surprised that uh, uh, people organizers can manage all this herd of cats, like speakers and the guests and everyone, so it's going quite well. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of talks just yet, but I looked at the talk list. It seems pretty interesting. There's definitely some knowledge which I'll be able to take out of this, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, any particular speech you're maybe looking forward to? Uh, to be frank, I'm so freaking out about my own talk that I haven't uh, figured out this specific one I want to see, but uh, I made like a small list. Uh, I uh, circled the, in, in our brochure, so I'll be looking into what I would really want to see. Uh, if you heard your own talk from the audience, what question would you like to ask yourself? Uh, whoa, that's, that's a difficult question. Um, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm kind of hoping that I'm giving all the information that I, I'm supposed to give. So I, I hope there won't be that many things unclear that will require more questions. I'll be talking a lot about component-based architecture, and uh, maybe that will be useful to elaborate on that, why Gorilla started with component-based architectures, why everybody's doing it pretty much. Uh, maybe something like this. Well, hopefully you find the needed answers, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're here with one of our speakers. Hello, please introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Alex Babko, head of Global Special Projects at Wargaming. So, Alex, tell us, what have you got to show us? Well, uh, today and uh, these days at 4C, uh, like the, the world's uh, best game designers, game developers are sharing their experience with everyone here at 4C. Uh, and uh, Wargaming also introduces uh, our best practices here. And uh, today we show to all the attendees uh, the, the new augmented reality experience that Wargaming has recently built. So basically we've taken the Sturm Tiger from World of Tanks to real life. 
uh, so that more people around the world can experience it, can interact with it, and that's basically what happens behind our backs. So those guys with HoloLens and with uh, the Google Tango device are seeing the future because they see the Sturm Tiger here in the, uh, at the conference, uh, but uh, all people around them who don't take the devices, they basically can't see that, but those guys are already seeing the future. Sounds amazing, but how does it work? Uh, well, uh, technically, it's a Unity-based application, but available on the Microsoft HoloLens and on Google Tango device. But from the story storytelling standpoint, uh, it's, a, it's part of Wargaming approach towards preserving history, so that we take the, uh, the model from World of Tanks, which is really unique in real world, so only two Sturm Tigers left in our world. But with help of augmented reality, we bring it to as many people as possible so that they can uh, explore this uh, masterpiece of engineering. So basically, we can relive history with this device, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. So this experience is already available uh, at the Tank Museum in Bovington, as well as in the Museum of History of Great Patriotic War in Minsk. And uh, we will bring it even closer to other locations as well. Pretty cool. Uh, can we see how it works? Uh, yeah, definitely. So we can now pick up the Microsoft HoloLens uh, and see what's inside, as well as maybe show to the uh, watchers some uh, screen screenshot from the uh, tablet, where you can also experience the augmented reality. I'm standing near the Sturm Tiger, a tank that has been recreated in augmented reality. It's so near I can almost touch it, except I can because it isn't there. But uh, I can clearly see it, I can see into every little detail of it. And there's actually a guide um, telling me about the story, the history of this uh, great vehicle. I hope you can see it on the screens. This is truly amazing technology. This is the future of museums and probably a lot more. This is amazing.